get past the rusting, rustic sheet. She, I'd idea. like to introduce our speaker today for our forum. This is Lee Little. He is the diocesan historiographer, and I practice a long time to say that word. It's a <laughs> Um, Lee is going to talk to us about race and the uh, Christchurch Cathedral history. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Lee. So I can use the microphone, I can also go without it. I am a large and loud person, so if there's any sort of uh, misunderstanding, it's not the right word, but that's sort of what I'm going for. If you can't hear me, just, just holler and let me know. The, the, this room is really funny, and so a microphone actually helps just because those of us over in the Hinterlands over here sometimes. In the low place, right? In the low places, <laughs> yes. We do. Well played. So let me see if I can uh, get this to a proper height. Is that acceptable? Okay. So good morning, everyone. I like to start these types of conversations with a little bit of a prayer. If you are familiar with morning prayer, right to this may sound familiar to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you, bring the nations into your fold, pour out your spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So, good morning. As uh, Marianne said, I am Lee Little, and I am the historiographer for the Episcopal Diocese of Indianapolis. I serve at the pleasure of you and your diocesan delegates. I am also a librarian and professor at the IU Robert H. McKinney School of Law just down the street on IUPUI's campus. I love church history, and I find the I social current that affects settlement okay. patterns and church development to be one of the most fascinating lenses to view church history, societal history, and similar trends over time. It's an important task for all of us to identify our potential biases as we're going into conversations like this. First, I do want to acknowledge, um, I forgot, my slides are all messed up now. Uh, it's, I didn't read these, I apologize. So here are my acknowledgments. Thank you to the cathedral community, particularly for, uh, the bishop, as well as uh, Father Gray, Canon Marian Scott, and Canon Brendan O'Sullivan Hale. So, I was talking about identifying biases. I am a straight, married, able-bodied white man with a high degree of education who earns enough to put me in the category of upper middle class. I also go to a Christian church, particularly the Episcopal Church. This puts me in the category of people that the entirety of Western civilization is designed to protect and uphold. So it's important as we go through this conversation to have that in mind as to what does that mean? Why has our civilization developed in this particular way to be able to protect somebody like me? And what does that mean for people that don't look like me? I think having that sort of uh, self-awareness is incredibly important for these types of conversations. It is, however, my belief that my Christian duty is to help others who are oppressed by that very system designed to uphold my privilege, um, to help to dismantle it in some way. The prayers of the people in the Book of Common Prayer make it clear when we pray that we all may be one. I will make mistakes in terms of the terms that I use and the vocabulary that I use at times, but it's important to have that self-awareness and to be able to have this conversation without fear of being judged unnecessarily. Um, I will make mistakes, you will make mistakes, but having a conversation in the first place is what is most important. A note on the accepted terms and terminology. I believe that BIPOC or BIPOC, I don't really like using that spoken part of the acronym, is the accepted term, but given that Indianapolis did not have a sizable non-black BIPOC population, until the 1970s, I will be speaking in terms of typically black and white um, during this conversation. Um, but it's much, much more complicated than that. So why are we talking about this now? Why are we having this conversation? We stand, as it says, at an inflection point where prevailing narratives and conventional wisdom should and can be investigated more easily than it ever has been. If you are like me, you have a supercomputer in your pocket that gives you access to almost all information from human history. Use it. So the history and facts are available, but they are often not discussed, or they are intentionally hidden due to shame um, about where we have come from. There's also racist housing policies that were enacted by governmental legal leaders at all levels, uh, many of whom were Christians and Episcopalians, uh, both at the state, local, and national levels. 
And then if you talk about the international levels, that's an entirely different conversation with uh, British hegemony over the past five centuries. And finally, understanding our role in and our reaction to race-based policies can help us avoid taking similar actions going forward. This is from the 1998 sesquicentennial um, book that was written about the Diocese of Indianapolis. And it just blows my mind how, well, how both how far we have come in terms of the way we talk about these things and also just how dated this seems less than 30 years on. Um, you see that St. Philip's, which is right up the street from us, that I'll talk about a little bit later, is specifically mentioned as a home for our, quote, colored churchmen. Who wrote this history? It was likely white folks from a position of power that were able to investigate this and give the prevailing narrative. Part of this conversation is breaking down that conventional narrative, the traditional ways of speaking about these things, and having a new set of facts, a new set of vocabulary and approaches going forward. So let me get, where, or get to where my slides are. And I also want to emphasize that this particular parish, the cathedral, which it has been since 1954, has done a lot of good things, a lot of bad things as well. And I want to emphasize that just because there are these exemplars in the history of our city, for instance, uh, Dean Paul Moore, who has his own complex legacy, speaking as, alongside um, Reverend Abernathy and Reverend uh, Dr. Martin Luther King in the 60s. That doesn't mean that there's not good things that have happened um, because of this parish and because of this diocese. I want to make that very clear, too. I'm not sort of out here whipping all of you into some sort of you know, self-loathing. Um, but there is a, a space for forgiveness and self-reflection that is very St. Paul himself, um, who is the patron saint of one of our sister parishes, had an, his own conversion experience. And relying on that, where he was a changed person based on his own experience with Christ. I call all of us to a similar experience of conversion when we're dealing with these types of issues so that we can have healthy conversations and an awareness of where we've come from. So the main ideas for today. Diocesan growth in Indianapolis has occurred alongside city growth in the 1860s, first decade of the 1900s, and then again in the 1950s. Secondly, redlining has had a lasting negative impacts on city development, especially for rates of home ownership and generational wealth among non-whites in the city. And finally, despite work by the diocese and parishes within the local and national civil rights movement, leaders, um, Sorry, congregations have generally arisen in areas where uh, parishioners who are typical Episcopalians have lived. I'll get into what a typical Episcopalian is here in just a moment. But before I get into that, what is our diocesan neighborhood? And more importantly, what has shaped our diocesan neighborhood? Indianapolis was basically just a frontier town um, until the Civil War. Starting in 1818, which was the Treaty of St. Mary's that was inked between the Delaware tribe and the federal government. Um, that was the Indian Removal Treaty that brought about white settlement in Indianapolis and Eastern settlement from colonizers, really, uh, from the East coming West. Episcopalians were among the earliest white colonizers of this area. Indianapolis was very, very isolated until the late 1830s when various means of transportation came to our city. You all certainly are familiar with the term the Circle City. That has very long roots, starting with the Central Canal that bankrupted the state starting in the 1830s when they thought that building a very robust canal system was a good idea. Um, I think the state still has sort of a, a weird relationship with federal and um, public funding about public infrastructure because of that. Um, Transportation continued to be constructed, though, with the National Road and the Michigan Road being built in 1837, which allowed the frontier village, really, to have people from elsewhere come with relative ease. You didn't have to cut your way through the forest on, you know, muddy roads for hours and hours and hours um, to get from town to town. In the 1840s, then, railroads started to arrive, starting in, I think, 1847 or so. Um, into the 1860s when the Civil War occurred, which really cemented Indianapolis as this transportation hub. There were things moving north to the south, south to the north, east to the west, etc. 
In the 1890s then, Indianapolis became a hub for automobile construction. Um, so you'll be potentially familiar with the Duesenberg Car Company, the Stutz Car Company. Those were based in Indianapolis. We were this hub for um, luxury automobiles, whereas Detroit was a hub for uh, sort of the middle class automobile industry. And then the interstates um, came in in the 1950s and were completed, I believe, by the early 1970s. And I think, if I'm correct, that Indianapolis has the most interstates converging on it of any city in the United States. Alongside that, and in hand in hand with some of those earlier trends, we have the Great Migration, which following the Civil War allowed um, refugees that were escaping slavery in the aftermath of slavery to come north and Indianapolis was also a burgeoning industrial town that had a lot of industry that needed workers. Um, so it was this movement north from southern blacks that were destined for cities like Chicago and Detroit, a lot of them also then stopped in Indianapolis, and started to settle in the area that is Indiana Avenue, which was a low place. It was infested with mosquitoes and things in, from the earliest days of the city. There were disease outbreaks for decades um, until somewhat recently in the city's history. I want to point out too that starting in 1851, you remember that uh, bankruptcy of the state starting from the canal system, they rewrote the constitution in 1851 to require us to have a balanced budget and also to require us to not have any new black settlement in the state. That was on the books from 1851 until 1881, although immediately after the Civil War, that enforcement was nullified by the Supreme if you have more questions about this, I encourage you to read The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. Later on then, so about 60 years after the Civil War, we have the Ku Klux Klan and the rise of sort of these conservative white supremacist movements at a political, um, politically organized scale. The Klan held major sway in state politics during the first several decades of the um, 20th century, and many clergy and churches supported their social platform. This is a list that you probably can't read um, from where you are, but it is a list of the clergy and congregations that um, were explicitly involved in the Klan. They paid membership dues and did other horrific things like had cross burnings on the church property. Fortunately, um, no Episcopal parishes or clergy were explicitly members of the Klan, although I would like to point out that a lot of the reason for the Klan's rise was because they supported uh, conservative, small c conservative um, social programs like temperance and uh, you know, strong family units, things like that. So this traditional waspy Protestantism that was anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant, and all of these really nasty things. So even though the Episcopal Church itself might not have um, had any members in the clergy, certainly the social programs that were supported by the church would have been also supported by the club. Following World War II then, we have the suburban boom where cities like Carmel and Fishers had a 300% um, increase in population in just 10 years. A lot of that has also to do with um, busing for schools in IPS, which is a, a, its own lecture in itself. But all of this is based on affordable automobiles um, rising numbers of, or rising mileage for local streets and interstates coming into the city that allowed folks to move out of the crowded downtown area, as it was often discussed, to the suburbs, where, you know, if you had your car, you could zip downtown in 30 minutes and then be back home to pet your dog, kiss your wife, and say goodnight to your two kids after you get home from work. With that, sundown towns began to grow in the donut counties and further afield um, and those were towns that the, uh, the local black population was not able to stay at or sort of don't be here after sundown or bad things will happen to you. So with all of that context in mind, who are we as a church? I want to get a few um, vocabulary words out of the way to begin with. We start with the cathedral. Christ Church is technically a pro-cathedral for the uh, bequest from Eli Lilly, who I'll talk about in a little bit. But the cathedral is the church that houses the bishop's seat. So if you see the presider's chair, or I believe the cathedral, uh, the, the cathedra is the chair that is in the church called the cathedral. 
Um, so it is a symbolic main church of the diocese. I think that Christ Church on Monument Circle is a wonderful symbolism for Christ at the center of our city. It's governed by a dean who we have here in our presence and also has a chapter rather than a vestry. A parish then is sort of the base unit for a congregation in the Episcopal Church, and that is a self-supporting congregation that is governed by a rector, who is the priest in charge, and a vestry. Finally, we have a mission, which is a congregation that receives support explicitly from the diocese for its daily comings and goings, and is governed by a vicar and a bishop's committee. A vicar is also a priest in charge. So currently in Indianapolis, what is the cathedral? We are standing beneath, I believe, the sanctuary at this point. Uh, but Christ Church has been a cathedral since the 1950s. All Saints, my home parish, is a parish, although it was the cathedral for many decades, starting in the 1880s. And Good Samaritan, I believe, is still in mission status out in Brownsburg. Who then is an Episcopalian? Who are we generally as a church nationwide? We are 65 years old, so relatively old, 30% or 35%, majority, like very, very strong majority, white, 90 plus percent, 85% plus native born, relatively well off, 69% make $50,000 or more, very well educated, 56% have a 40 year degree or more, generally married and generally moderate or liberal. This is somewhat typical for the mainline Protestant denominations. The Presbyterians are more white than us. Um, the Methodists are much more of a patchwork of various demographics, but this is generally, according to the Pew Research Center, who Episcopalians are. Why do you have Hispanic people there? This is just giving a general overview, um, and they didn't have language um, breakdowns for who of which denominations speak what languages unless it was a specifically um, Spanish-speaking uh, congregation, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, so we're going to take the nationwide demographics and narrow it down to Hoosier Episcopalian demographics. As of 2019, there were about 6.7 million people in the state, of which around 12,500 are Episcopalians. Now that is pre-pandemic numbers. So take that with a little bit of a, a grain of Moderna or Pfizer, depending on your particular <laughs> dose, which equates to 0.18% of the state population across both dioceses. The Diocese of Indianapolis, again, um, pre-pandemic numbers, has around 8,800 members with an average Sunday attendance of around 3,500. There are 82 total congregations. Actually, I need to adjust that. St. Stephen's Elwood closed down in the fall. Um, so there are now 81 congregations in Indiana. There are two that are historically black congregations. So you have St. Augustine's up in Gary and St. Philip's not far from where we are in Indianapolis. How has our diocese developed over time, particularly our diocese in Indianapolis? Christ Church, this wonderful congregation, has been around since 1837 and it's been the cathedral since 1954. You can see here, these are all of the congregations in Indianapolis and the Donut Counties. Um, and there is a, a, an offshoot starting around uh, 1956 with the rise in suburban communities in Indianapolis area. Um, I'm not including like, uh, what's the one up in Fishers, Holy Family, or um, St. Christopher Carmel, because those are part of the story of Indianapolis, but St. Albans and Nativity have Indianapolis addresses rather than Carmel or Fishers or Brown. Um, you can see here that there are several that have moved around over time, um, particularly Grace, which uh, is currently All Saints from 1910 to the present. Um, it was the cathedral from 1889 to 1948. Why am I telling you all of this? It's because we need to look at the history of where we are, how the city has expanded over time, and what that says about us what that says about Christ Church as a parish. There's record of some early Episcopalian clergy in Indianapolis as early as the 1820s. He was a uh, itinerant preacher that was a member of the um, Diocese of Maryland. When the National Road came through, he baptized some folks, he preached a little bit, but the Methodists beat us to it by a long shot um, with the first recorded Methodist sermon in 1819. Um, Christ Church itself, though, was established in 1837, coinciding with the arrival of the National Road and early, <coughs> early, early railroads. 
Early vestry members were formerly members of the Presbyterian Church, which is now First Meridian Heights Presbyterian. Um, they had their own interesting history over time, um, particularly as it relates to white flight in the 50s. Um, but there was no other option for the early Episcopalians in Indianapolis. They could have gone to the Methodist Church, but they were Presbyterian in their practice and theology, which I think says a lot about how we have developed as a relatively low church diocese compared to some of our neighbors. Um, that's a conversation for a different time as well. Just be aware that you know those more um, reformed Calvinist sort of strains were present much earlier on compared to the Methodist sort of approaches. Indianapolis, like I said, was established in 1821. Um, there are things that go along with being the oldest congregation on its original lot. This here, it, it, it just blew my mind when I read this for the first time. So the lots of Indianapolis were sold to fund the prison at Jeffersonville, which was built in the 1830s. It burned down many decades later, but it goes to reason that the land that the congregation gave to the state or, and the federal government to purchase the lot that we are currently on went to fund a prison somewhere else in the state. Um, so just looking through all of this, there are many things to uncover, and having that sort of um, penal system tie to the earliest days of when this congregation was founded I think deserves a little bit of um, investigation in a way that, you know, until you read this, it's like, oh, well, I just thought we bought the land from somebody else, or, no, that, that's not the case. The money had to go somewhere. It wasn't just to somebody. It was to the state. So that early version of Christ Church, that 1837 building that was, sold, uh, that was built on land, sold for that very first prison down in Jeffersonville, stood on this lot from 1837 to about 1857 or so, a little bit earlier. Um, but you can see here that when the building was sold, it was sold to what is now Bethel AME, which I believe is up on Michigan Road, but their old building stood um, on um, the canal at Vermont Street. It's now encased in a hotel. Um, I encourage you to go and take a look at it because they have done a okay job of preserving the interior, uh, but I'm just glad that it wasn't torn down. Um, so you can see that we sold it, the old building, to Bethel AME, and that building then was almost immediately burned down by a racist mob during the Civil War. That's another whole part of the history of the city um, during the Civil War that really, I, it doesn't speak well to us Indianapolis. Um, so at the same time, though, we were building this current building. You can see that the uh, third Presbyterian church, which is now Tabernacle up in Middleton Fall Creek, was being constructed, its first building around the same time that we were. And it's just cool to be able to go back and see all of this uh, contemporary newspaper records of the construction of the building that is there, I believe, if I'm pointing the right way. And you can see people have loved this building for a very, very long time. Uh, beautiful design is being faithfully carried out, and when completed, it will be unsurpassed if equaled in the West. This is the oldest picture of Christ Church that I can find. Um, if I am correct, although I may not be, this is from before the steeple was added, although I have my suspicions, that may just be bad Photoshop, uh, trying to make it fit into that specific little uh, square of the newspaper. There have been several attempts to move or consolidate Christ Church over the decades, but they were all happily unsuccessful. The status was cemented in 1948 when an anonymous donation by a man called Eli Lilly was secured on Monument Circle. And I'll get to him here in a little bit. He gave a million dollars to shift cathedral status from All Saints to Christ Church. This was his home parish, um, and he wanted to make sure that there was an Episcopalian presence at the center of the city. He then uh, transformed the parish from a self-governing parish to the cathedral with all of the, uh, the blessings and curses that come with that status. I want to emphasize, though, that for 30 years, before all of that happened, before the city is what we see it today, this was the only parish in town for Episcopalians. So just keep that in mind. You are in a small frontier city that has you know, several tens of thousands of people. Most of them are Methodists, there's a small number of Catholics, there's a small number of Presbyterians, and a couple of Baptists here and there. 
with an even smaller number of Episcopalians. This was the church home for those of the Anglican Communion in Indianapolis for 30 years as the city was developing into what we see today. Which brings me to Horace Stringfellow. So the Civil War hit, and this man was the rector of Christ Church from 1859 to 1862. He was a very complex character. He was born in Virginia to a family of um, Episcopal ministers, and he was the rector of Christ Church, like it says, from 1859 to 1862. Being a Virginian or a Southerner in Indianapolis at the time was a very um, dicey situation. The city generally was pro-union, although there were Democrat, Southern-leaning um, elements that tried to make life very difficult for the Southerners. We also had a number of prison camps that held Civil War prisoners from the South that were transported from the battlefield to a place very, very far away from any Southern support. He, as a Virginian, found it to be his duty to go and minister to the, um, the men that were imprisoned at Camp Morton in what is now Heron Morton, and almost immediately, he was run out of town. There is conflicting stories as to what actually he did in terms of ministering. I think some of the more sympathetic ones that were written around the time that he died indicate that he just went and held mass or divine service up there. Some of the more um, anti-Southern um, newspaper articles indicate that he was probably smuggling mail and food and supplies to the prisoners at the camp. So I don't know exactly what happened. There's no like non-biased anything in history when you're looking at this type of thing. But there's nothing that he was never brought up on trial for this. He was never sort of brought to a tribunal or anything to really suss out what happened. But he was run out of town. He sent his family to Canada and he resigned his commission as the rector and went to be a chaplain in the Army of the Virginia under General Lee, which is fascinating. Um, because if he's not doing something that is actively pro-Confederate in Indianapolis, he's certainly doing something anti-Union and pro-Confederate in his work as the chaplain in the main army of the Confederacy. Who here knows vice presidential trivia? Indiana had for a long time um, the highest number of vice presidents of any state, including Thomas Hendricks. Um, Thomas Hendricks was one of the vestrymen during the Civil War um, who accepted the resignation of our uh, Reverend Stringfellow. Here's a map of all of the Civil War prison camps in Indianapolis. Is anybody familiar with um, the case, anybody, anybody a lawyer in here, um, the case Ex Parte Milligan? That's about, uh, my law school professors are going to be very upset with me that I can't remember the specifics of it, but there was a man who was a civilian who was going to be executed by a um, military uh, hanging squad, basically. And he came from Indiana. He was from Indiana, and he was going to be executed at Camp Morton. Uh, which is fascinating. So, like I said, Indianapolis, staunchly unionist because of the presence of the state capitol here, a lot of Republicans, so pro-unionists coming from around the state, but there was also this you know, very prolific um, prison system here in Indianapolis uh, where troops that were coming from Chicago or further north would go south, folk, uh, troops coming south back from the battlefields to go home, would stop here and sort of be mustered out, I believe is the, the proper term. So Reverend Stringfellow came back after the Civil War. He had joined his family up in um, Canada and um, had also resigned his commission in the Confederate Army when that dissolved. And he brought with him into the church um, Thomas Hendricks and another senator from Indiana. Um, and he was the founding rector of our beloved sister parish, St. Paul's. Their history is much more complex than what we have here because of that. It was founded on this separatist ideology. So Civil War occurred in 1866. St. Paul's broke off from Christ Church. There are generally um, motions made to the fact that it wasn't a political split, 
at the consecration of the original St. Paul's building at New York and Illinois. The bishop speaks about how there is no north, south, east, or west in Christ. There is no pro-union, anti-union in Christ. We are all one, which if you read between the lines, that tells me that there was a lot of division. It was not as easy as what he is saying. So as you can see here, St. Paul's, like I said, has their own complex history. They were less than a thousand feet as the crow flies from our current space. They were there from 1866 until 1946 when they moved to their current location. Um, so with this in mind, what do we think, this is not sort of a, an open question, but sort of keep this in your mind, how does that history of the split where the anti-unionists, the conf potential confederate leaning Democrats went to form their own parish and more of the pro-unionists went to stay in Christchurch. It, it's fascinating and I think you can have an endless conversation about how all of this actually played out. Certainly there was a lot of um, porous nature in the political leanings of both congregations. St. Paul's um, until relatively recently and I think still is, has more wealth than Christchurch, uh, particularly compared to sort of the, the earlier versions of Christchurch before the Lilly money came along. Um, so what does that say about having a structural foundation from the very beginning of some sort of white separatist sort of approach? Not to say that we as Christchurch have not had that, but just keep that in mind um, where it's difficult to have that conversation because you can't point to any one thing at either parish and say, oh, well, yes, you are this, no, you are that, and they are still our siblings in Christ. Um, so I'm not trying to condemn, just noting that that is the foundation of St. Paul's, and we are the, uh, the parish that has its own history. So after the Civil War, after St. Paul's has split off, many attempts to consolidate St. Paul's and Christ Church um, to move Christ Church up to where All Saints is now so that there's more of a strong diocesan presence in the rich neighborhood of the Old North Side. In the 1880s, this was a, um, a resolution that was introduced at the General Convention in the 18, I believe it's 1883 that this was introduced. Stotzenberg uh, was a judge down in New Albany. He was a vestryman at um, St. Paul's New Albany, and he thought, as well as many of his fellow Episcopalians and his fellow white folks in the United States in the 1880s, with you know, the rise of the Great Migration um, and a large black presence in historically white uh, cities of the North, that there should be separate churches. They thought about having separate churches for um, the black communicants so that they would not mix with the white communicants. And you can see here, this is from a general convention journal um, just pulled directly from there. So they were at least taking pains to think about these sort of trends um, over time. Which leads me to St. Philip's Episcopal Church, which is not far from where we are now. That hierarchy, that sort of approach of segregating the congregations black Episcopalians and white Episcopalians led to the foundation at three separate times of Christ, uh, St. Philip's. Originally, it was a parish that was a plant of Christ Church in the 1880s. The missionary who was from the West Indies died um, relatively early on in the ministry and sort of fizzled when it was in this building on the left. There was another chance to have some sort of black Episcopal congregation in Indianapolis in the 1890s. That event fizzled, and it was not until eight, or 1902, I believe, the end of 1902, around Christmas time, that this version of St. Philip's, which is the one that we see today, although not the same building, but that iteration of the congregation has lasted since 1902. A separate but equal mission for black Episcopalians in Indianapolis. Um, so that 1902 version of St. Paul, uh, St. Philip's was an offshoot of uh, St. Paul's, and they worshiped in the Horace String Fellow Memorial Chapel um, at St. Paul's downtown before that building that you see can be built. I want to emphasize here that St. Philip's was then in mission status until 1954. 1954 is a huge year for um, 
race relations in the country because that is the year of Brown versus Board of Education. If you're familiar with some of the uh, historically black denominations of Methodism, there's the AME, which is African Methodist Episcopal, AME Zion, which is AF African Methodist Episcopal Zion, and the CME, which today is Christian Methodist Episcopal. That was founded, though, as the Colored Methodist Episcopal, and they changed their name in 1954 because of the Brown decision. They said, this is not what we want to represent anymore, so we're changing the C to something that is more apt to how we approach things. So you can see that both um, Christ Church with uh, the cathedral, they're all, actually all saints would have been the cathedral at that point, but um, Christ Church and the cathedral would have been working together on the St. Philip's mission, and St. Paul's was also busy with mission work, but not in the Indiana Avenue neighborhood, which was the historically black cultural center of Indianapolis. Yesterday we celebrated Absalom Jones, who was the very first black priest in, well, not in Indiana, in the Episcopal Church in 1803, I believe, first decade of the um, 19th century. This we have here is Reverend, uh, Yes. Um, that is not Lewis Brown, sorry. That is Julius Cox. Um, he was a postal worker. Uh, Lewis Brown was the uh, rector of St. Paul's at the time. Um, he was the first black man, and I apologize for um, blanking on his name. Uh, Julius Cox was the first black man to be ordained a priest uh, in Indiana that was black. Um, which happened in 1903, and he then served relatively quickly after his ordination as um, Booker T. Washington's personal secretary, and actually died in Washington, D.C. while working in that role. Um, but he helped to build the St. Philip's congregation to um, a very large congregation. Um, it was larger than All Saints for many, many years until the congregations started to integrate in the 1950s after Brown. So, that takes us to about 1920. Remember, the Klan starts to rise um, in the years following the Civil War, taking particular hold in the early 1920s. This is what the inside of Christchurch would have looked like at that time. Personally, if I had any sort of interior design say about what occurs in the sanctuary, Please bring it back. <laughs> um, particularly the, uh, the stained glass windows behind the altar. But that's, uh, I believe, above my pay grade um, as a lay person in this particular diocese. So 1920s, Klan comes, Klan goes, but the politics really stay. 1946, the Indiana Chamber of Commerce commissions this map. If you notice, this map has the title of Distribution of Negroes in Indianapolis. This was going to be how the city, how planning agencies, both private and public, made decisions about what was going to occur development-wise in the city. If you look, you can see this area over here now has a, run, uh, a runway, looks like a runway sometimes, an interstate plowing through it. This is the Indiana Avenue neighborhood. This is Hawville. Um, Wes Montgomery grew up, um, the jazz guitarist grew up in Hawville, and then he played for countless gigs on Indiana Avenue. If you notice, too, it is down to the house level of who lived where. You can see a couple down here out in what is uh, West Indianapolis, um, some down here, down by the train yard over there, out here in Irvington, there's a couple. Um, and in this one right here, there was a very robust Jewish and black neighborhood on the near south side. Um, so if you're familiar with Shapiro's, um, that is the last bastion of old Jewish Indianapolis. Um, there's a couple of historically black congregations in that part of town too, that you know nobody, the proper white folks didn't want to live near the Jews or the blacks. So they tended to group together in the city, which is great. I think that that really shows sort of a, a communal spirit um, where oppression leads to, it, it does not lead to anything good, but it leads to some good coincidences um, in terms of how communities come together to face that oppression together. Um, but you can see here, there's a lot of 
things that no longer exist under these particular areas. I want to make two very clear, the interstate and IEPUI. IEPUI is my employer, um, so I suppose I owe them a debt of gratitude for a lot of things, but they destroyed the once strong black neighborhood in the Indiana Avenue area. Um, there are entire seminar courses that you could teach on that, but um, it was chosen for a reason, and that reason looks something like this. That was 1946, this is 1963, and this shows the integrated and segregated blocks in the city. Anything that has color is a segregated um, block in the city, and I want to prepare for these side by side. So you can see that the two maps side by side generally tell the same story, but I think that the one of progression over time shows a much more detailed and pernicious um, story as to what was happening. So World War II occurs. The middle class, the white middle class at least, starts to rise in a way that is unlike anything that we have seen before or since um, in the country's history, and they start to engage in a phenomenon called white flight, where the suburbs, because there are cheap automobiles that are readily available with uh, high amounts of credit, um, home loans uh, for returning GIs were relatively easy to come by with good rates and things like that, but only if you were white. So Carmel, Fishers, the surrounding Donut counties start to have just explosions in the amounts of people that are living there. Within that then, the black middle class starts to rise as well. And they move into the old houses that the former rich lived in. So you can see the old north side for a while, starting in the 50s, started to become a black neighborhood. Um, the Mapleton Fall Creek neighborhood starts to become a black neighborhood, which is great. I, I love that um, you know these beautiful houses were able to be reused, to be sold to this new community that people that used to own them certainly didn't want them anymore. Um, but you can see how it was documented in two very different ways. One is for an anti-segregation approach. One is for a how do we plow through these houses and bulldoze them and develop this into something that we can use. Which leads me to a discussion of the red line, which is not a bus system per se, although our particular city does have a red line rapid transit city or system. Redlining was the practice by which the federal government would draw um, areas of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, of sizable black populations and other dangers to lenders um, as a warning to mortgage lenders, effectively isolating black people in areas that would suffer low levels of investment compared to their white counterparts. It was official federal policy from 1935 to 1977. You know who died in 1977? It's Eli Lilly, uh, which is interesting, and I'll get to that in just a little bit. But basically what this looks like is green areas are areas which were sort of the hot spots in town. You can see um, coming up here, uh, the Meridian Kessler um, sort of area then you have blue areas, which were not as hot, but still very good areas to live in, um, according to the folks that drew these lines. Um, there's a couple on the south side, a couple out in Irvington. Um, this little enclave right here is Brendonwood, um, which is a gated community that has been gated since the 20s. Um, red, no, not red. Yellow is sort of this, it could go either way sort of approach. So you have wide swaths of what is the growing area of suburbia, sort of up here on the far east side, the northeast side, and on the west side, that, you know, it, it may become a desirable area, it may go the other way. And the other way then is where anybody that was not rich and white lived. Um, so that is the red areas here. The areas downtown um, and in sort of these industrial areas were not classified because the core was not a, a, a residential area. Um, so Christchurch is not um, categorized, but every single other Indianapolis area parish is. I want to emphasize that it's not all race-based. There are very small exceptions for areas that are um, prone to flooding 
or have heavy industry in them. So Rocky Ripple, anybody ever driven through Rocky Ripple? It's an interesting part of town, I guess I would say. Um, that's prone to flooding, so that's red. But that's one of the very few in Indianapolis that is not race-based redlining. I'm gonna take a quick drink. And as I'm taking this drink, think about it. 1977 was within living memory of most of you. Um, not mine, but most of you. Uh, that was 45 years ago. Um, and, and we still feel the reverberations of that today. Um, so this didn't go nowhere when the policy ended. We're still feeling the after effects of it today, like up until, what, 12.10 on February 13th? Who was behind city government at this particular juncture of our history? This man, Reginald Sullivan, I believe the only man to be the son of a former governor and mayor of Indianapolis. He was the senior warden of St. Paul's and the mayor at the same time. I told you that they have a much more complex history than Christ Church does. <laughs> But all of it is to say that these structural issues that we're seeing had Episcopalians, had people of faith, had people that heard the gospel allegedly on a week-to-week -week basis making decisions like this to enforce these structures of racial segregation and white supremacy. And that doesn't just go nowhere. Um, so what does that actually look like in terms of a breakdown? 5% of the city was seen as green, or desirable, or hot spots. 9% was still desirable, but not as hot as greens. So that is what? 14% of the city's land area is desirable? I, I cannot disagree more with the statement about that, except for maybe Rocky Hill, but um, <laughs> the rest of it though, highly hazardous, definitely declining, and each of these sections will have notes. So some of them are absolutely disgusting in what they say, where it says um, just categorizing the people and essentializing them by race, by class, by all of these other categories that you know we all may be one, we are all made of the same blood of Christ. Dividing so that you can have some sort of profit is the exact reason that this was made. You can see greens, generally white, wealthy, and suburban. Blues, generally white and middle class. Yellows were generally white and working class. There are no yellow regions, blue regions, or green regions that had any black inhabitants in them. So all of the redlining was done around black, place, uh, black neighborhoods. Where are our parishes in this? None of them were in the green zone. Um, St. Paul's is quite close to a green zone, but it's in a yellow zone up here in that little sliver. Um, I also want to emphasize that a lot of these neighborhoods that were green and blue were restricted. So people that were not white or perceived as white, so no Jews or blacks in the neighborhoods. And that was listed in the listings for these properties, um, which is Pretty disgusting. So we see blue as well. We have Trinity and St. Matthew's out in Irvington or on 10th Street. Yellow then was All Saints, St. Tim's, uh, St. Albans, and St. Paul's. Red, St. Philip, St. George's, and Holy Innocents. And not categorized, as I said, because it's at the center of the city in the industrial area is Christ Church. What did downtown look at, look like at that particular time? How did the map actually play out? St. Paul's was right here, it's no longer right there um, at New York and Illinois Street, but this is the general neighborhood, the, the walking distance neighborhood for Christchurch. Y'all have always been here on Monument Circle since 1837, and God willing, we'll continue to be here for many, many years to come. Um, and you can see that I've overlaid the map so that this big square here is that 1946 map overlaid against the red line. So I think sometimes graphical representations of what this all looks like can be very helpful instead of just saying, downtown was redlined. Yeah, well, it was redlined like this. So St. Philip's, regardless of where it's been in its history, has always been in a non-desirable 
dangerous to lend to folks living there in the neighborhood. So 1948, Eli Lilly gives a grant to um, the diocese as an anonymous gift of $1 million so that Christ Church will become a I'm showing you this graph here um, because it sort of shows the, the spreadsheet that I've compiled over time um, of the number of congregants at each parish. Um, the circled area is 1950. So Christ Church was much larger than St. Paul's for many decades. 1950 is that equalization point. 1948, or 1946, sorry, is the year here that St. Paul's moved up to where it is. They lost a couple of members. Um, but then skyrocketed to today when they are a very, very large, I believe they're the largest parish in the diocese. Um, but you can see there was a peak here in the late 60s, and this is 1928 to 1978, so a 50-year period. Um, moving to the suburbs was a growth strategy for St. Paul's, and they contemplated that for a very long time. Staying in downtown Indianapolis was also a growth strategy for Christ Church. It came with its own um, detriments in some ways, uh, but it also has maintained this presence of the gospel uh, since the lily money came in. So let me catch up on my slides, which leads me to this man, our beloved Eli Lilly, who seems like you can't turn over a stone without having some sort of impact of his. He was a member of this congregation baptized here, um, and I believe that his uh, funeral was here in 1977 as well. This is the grant, the anonymous grant that he gave in 1948. He saw that many parishes were moving out of downtown to the suburbs, to these areas to be closer to the folks that were part of this congregation. So St. Paul's had its own um, movement. A lot of the Presbyterian churches had their own movement. Methodist churches started to explode in the suburbs as well. Um, but it is the hope, but not an extent, a condition of this gift, that until such time as the Protestant Episcopal Diocese of Indianapolis may be able to construct and support a cathedral, Christ Church on Monument Circle in the city of Indianapolis may be designated as the pro-cathedral of the diocese. I am also waiting until such time that the Protestant Episcopal Diocese may construct and support a cathedral. Um, but until then, I am also very glad that Christ Church serves in this role. A million dollars in 1948 was an incredible amount of money. Um, I think that I've seen the inflation calculator, and it was in the t equivalent of tens of millions um, today. So just imagine that. This, this amount of wealth, this generational wealth that is now being poured in to the city. Lee, will you uh, describe what the difference is between a pro-cathedral and a cathedral? I hope I can. Okay. So a cathedral, a pro-cathedral is a temporary, is a church that is temporarily given the status of cathedral until a real, non-qualified cathedral is constructed. Um, they have the same role. They both contain the bishop's seat. They're the ceremonial presence in the diocese. Um, yeah, it's just it's temporary. And so, like Bishop Jennifer tomorrow morning could decide to move move her seat to the Holy Family and Fishers, and that would be the cathedral. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a temporary game. So, <laughs> so count your blessings for now. <laughs> so that's a lot of money. That's a lot of status. That's a lot of power that one man gave to one church. You can see here. Um, there's a an obituary, basically, of Bishop Crane, who we also see over there. Um, it's, uh, it's funny. I, I love the beginning of the third paragraph. It wasn't always easy to minister to him, because one of the stipulations was that his gifts be anonymous. Everybody knew that it was him. You know, they, nobody else. What other Episcopalian in town? There are a lot of them. Anyway, who else could have done this gift for um, Christ Church to make it the cathedral? Who was willing to give this sort of loving gift to the congregation? It was Lily. <laughs> Lily was an arch conservative and very much against the commingling of um, what you would see as racial issues and spiritual issues. 
I happen to believe that it's all connected and racial justice, social justice is a spiritual issue. But for a lot of people, um, starting with issues of race and continuing to issues of um, the LGBT community in the church, wanted that separation between, oh, I'm going to church, this is not related to any sort of social activism. You can see a very, very paternal um, approach to race relations in the city said that black Episcopalians have, quote, their own place at St. Philip's. St. Philip's was a mission, so it was dependent on diocesan support, even though it was one of the largest parishes downtown until 1954. Their own place, it's not self-governing. It, it doesn't allow any sort of decision-making to be done by the congregants, even though it's larger than most of the other parishes that do make their own decisions. I think this is particularly telling. There will never be a little rock on Monument Circle. That's horrifying. But it also shows that having that um, integration was more of a practical decision, sort of the optics, rather than a true, let's have everybody be here together sort of approach. It's practical. And I don't want the church to be green with pink polka dots, but that's sort of his approach, too. Um, like I said, Arch Conservative voted for Goldwater. You can see here, Goldwater was sort of a, a, a premonition of the, the Trumpism that came about. Um, and he had a huge disagreement with the rector at the time, um, Peter Lawson, who I believe is still alive. Yes. His, uh, his LinkedIn account lists him as agitator. I love that. And you can see here that he would start talking about racial equality and issues of social justice from the pulpit, which just enraged Lily. And um, so Lilly moved to Trinity. He pulled his money from his congregation. The congregation began to falter. In terms of also upholding these issues of sort of traditional um, power structures, Bishop Crane wanted to placate Lilly because in 1969 there was a lot of heat, white, uh, red hot summer stuff going on where you know, social justice was at the forefront. So in order to combat that, Bishop Crane allowed these social justice priests to continue their preaching, um, but he also hosted a, uh, a mass up at St. Paul's for the law enforcement community. And to me, regardless of what your stance on law enforcement is, showing or inviting members of the power structure into a church that was a limited capacity service for the sole purpose of showing that we stand with our law enforcement shows where the power structure of the church is aligning itself with the power structure of the, the, the secular world as well. Um, I can't imagine the response from some of them, but I can imagine the response from Lily. He was in favor of that, so he started to go to St. Paul's. He started to go to Trinity. And um, this is 1964. Three, I believe, is when he stopped giving money to the church and to the diocese. And it, uh, the resonance of this language is still uh, what is used by a lot of folks that are um, not progressive might use today. So in 1972, then, he announced that Lawson was leaving, and uh, it was personally told to him by Bishop Crane. And the next Sunday, Lily came back started to give his money to the diocese and to the church again, and the church's deficit disappeared almost immediately. So this was very much a power play by, um, by Eli Lilly, our benevolent benefactor. Um, so all of that is to say that there are these huge questions. This is just the very start of this conversation, or at least I hope it is, where there's so much to uncover. There are so many things that have affected our congregation, our diocese, our city, and our state, and our nation, um, and it starts from within, I think. You know, you have to have this internal conversion if it hasn't already happened to you, um, and that is going to change your outward behavior, and it's about dismantling these social hierarchies. It's about picking apart everything, because Christ called us to conversion and to rend our hearts, not our garments, and return to the Lord your God. Uh, there's a lot of other sort of Old Testament verses that are a lot more um, explicit as to what happens to those that don't do this. Um, but I 
would like to close again with Luke. Um, I have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. Um, so thank you all, and I look forward to questions.